Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Meetings to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the First Minister who was it, when talking about the NHS, that said a party that is now in its second term of office cannot avoid taking responsibility for its own failings? First Minister. Well, if she's talking about me, let me say very clearly, I will never avoid taking responsibility for the NHS. That is one of the most uh, sacred responsibilities that any government has. Can I also say that I'm very proud of our National Health Service, but I will never, ever shy away from facing up to the challenges in our National Health Service. Uh, the job of myself, the job of the Health Secretary is to work with the frontline staff in our NHS to make sure that we help them address those challenges. That's why we are committing extra resources to our National Health Service. John Swinney had already announced £80 million more than planned for next year. Yesterday he announced £125 million of extra funding. Yeah. And I have given a commitment that if this government is re-elected, then for each and every year of the next parliament, we will commit to above inflation increases in health spending. Labour hasn't yet committed to that. Maybe Jackie Bailey will today. Yeah. Jackie Bailey. I'm delighted that Nicola Sturgeon, who's not normally coy about recalling her own words, does recognise that those were indeed hers. And can I rise to the challenge? Because we'll match the commitment on all consequentials going to health. We'll match the commitment to protect the revenue budget. But we'll go further. Our mansion tax will, in fact, increase funding for health. But I have to say, yesterday's debate flew in the face of the First Minister's comments issued just now. There seemed to be a denial about the problems and the challenges. Indeed, last month Alex Neil said there was no crisis at NHS Grampian, but in the last week alone we've seen the crisis laid bare. Consultant shortages so severe, doctors are being flown in from Jamaica and India. Accident and emergency treatment times, missed. Cancer treatment waiting times, missed. Fewer nurses to beds than in other hospitals in Scotland. Bed blocking targets, missed. A failing care of the elderly service, and most damning of all, patient safety at risk. Saved only by the dedication of staff working under extreme pressure. The RCN told us they'd been raising serious concerns about the NHS for quite some time, NHS Grampian in particular. In fact, they raised these concerns directly with the SNP government. In any case, Surely the Scottish Government should have noticed there was a problem. Is there anyone in Government who has a clue about what was going on? First Minister. Jackie Bailey, I think, strikes entirely the wrong tone when it comes to our National Health Service. Because I think we should try across this chamber to find common ground and all of us accept that our NHS does great work but that it needs our support, the support of all of us, to do even better work. Now, Grampian NHS Board, as Jackie Bailey is well aware, has in place a new chief executive who has accepted all of the recommendations of the reports that were published earlier this week. The Health Secretary will oversee the implementation plan very, very closely. All of us are now absolutely focused in making sure that the failings that were identified in NHS Grampian, failings identified by the regime of inspection that this government put in place can now be fixed in the interests of all of the patients that rely on NHS Grampian. And I would hope that Jackie Bailey and Labour could find it within themselves also to get behind the efforts of the new management and the staff in NHS Grampian as they decide uh, how to move forward. But can I also pick up on just a, a couple of the points that Jackie Bailey made. Waiting times, uh, we still have work to do in waiting times. I don't for a second deny that. But waiting times are now considerably shorter than they were when Labour yeah, left office. Uh, Jackie Bailey mentioned consultants. NHS consultants working in our NHS are now at a record high number, up 36.8% yeah. since this government 
took office. Overall staff in the health service up, as we saw in figures earlier this week, since this government took office. So this government is acting. And you know, we look at one of the what I consider to be the most significant challenges in our NHS today, the challenge of delayed discharge. Uh, that is the problem that then creates problems in other parts of the system. Delayed discharges are too high right now. I want to see them come down. But they're significantly lower than they were in 2006 when the last Absolutely. government left office. So we are making progress, presiding officer, and we will continue to seek to make progress forwards. And I think it would fit Labour better if they stopped criticising those working so hard in our NHS and got behind them. Jackie Bailey. We support the efforts of all at NHS Grampian. We actually thank them for doing the work that they shouldn't have had to do because the government let them down. They were under extreme pressure. The only reason that patient safety is as it is, is because of the efforts of those staff. So I will take no lessons from Nicola Sturgeon about praising the NHS staff. The difference is we on this side of the chamber would support them. Patient care should be at the centre of all our considerations. And yet patient safety was put at risk in Aberdeen. Health Improvement Scotland issued a stark warning. They said, we found a number of issues relating to leadership and culture which reduced the quality and safety of care. The General Medical Council said, evidence that patient safety and care could have been compromised was overwhelming. The RCN said that without a patient assurance system, managers were not able to assure themselves or the board about the quality and safety of patient care. So we should again thank the staff for ensuring that despite the challenges they faced, they put patients first. The Scottish Government were warned about all of this, presiding officer. It dates back to the First Minister's time as Health Secretary. So does the First Minister agree that these concerns about patient safety are not just a failure at NHS Grampian, but also the Scottish Government's Health Department, which she led? First Minister. I am not going to stand here and despite the provocation I'm not going to stand here and engage in a party political bun fight because I believe I believe the NHS is actually too important for that but I think Jackie Bailey should reflect on some of what she said there in her desperation Order. to throw as much dirt at the SNP government as she can she was in danger there I think of misquoting the report that was published into Absolutely. Aberdeen Royal Infirmary earlier this week. Because while I am not defending anything in that report, that report was very careful to say that patient safety had not been compromised. Of course, when there are failings, like the failings that were identified, patient safety could have been compromised, and that is inexcusable. But Jackie Bailey should be very careful not to suggest something happened that the inspectors themselves said didn't happen. Now, I repeat again, I am proud of the NHS. I'm proud of the progress this government is making in the NHS. Waiting times are lower. Our hospitals are cleaner, although as we see in the report on Glasgow Royal Infirmary today, there is still work to be done there. Infection rates are at an all-time low. Rates of C. difficile uh, down by over 80% in the over 65 population. So this government is making significant progress. And unlike Labour, we don't have to be dragged kicking and screaming into making financial commitments to our NHS. You know, I, I watched a couple of weeks ago each and every single one of the Labour leadership candidates refused to give that financial commitment to the NHS. I heard Richard Simpson Order. ask about it in this chamber yesterday. Yeah. His answer to, will you give increases to the NHS budget was, we will see. And then Jackie Bailey, in desperation tomorrow, comes up with that. We give that commitment freely to the NHS because we put our money where our mouth is and we will always defend our National Health Service. Jackie Bailey. I think it's the First Minister that does a bit too much kicking and screaming. Um, there was nothing desperate about our commitments and I hope she would welcome them. But perhaps I could remind her, perhaps I could remind her that from 2007 to 10, 
when Labour were in charge at a UK level. They gave the Scottish Government more in health consequentials than she actually passed on to the health service. So I will take no lessons from her on that. But, Presiding Officer, I fear that the First Minister, like Alex Neil before her, seems to be in denial about the scale of the problem facing Scotland's health service. NHS Grampian is not alone. Even today, we see a damning report about the cleanliness of basic equipment at Glasgow Royal Infirmary. Blood and body fluids contaminating beds and equipment, yeah. highlighted not once, but twice, and problems remaining. Does she take any responsibility for this? Or for consultant vacancies having more than doubled, leading to a record £82 million spent on hiring temporary doctors? Does she take any responsibility for bed numbers being slashed? Any responsibility for accident and emergency departments in crisis and delayed discharge increasing? Presiding officer, the SNP government has not just failed patients in Aberdeen, but has failed them across Scotland. The First Minister cannot duck responsibility for this. She was the Health Secretary for five years. It was, of course, Nicola Sturgeon who said, a party that is now in its second term of office cannot avoid taking responsibility for its own failings. So can the First Minister tell us when is she going to take responsibility? First Minister. I don't know, it, it might be a good idea. I mean, I used to ask the questions on the opposition benches. I, I would just say to Jackie Bailey, I know she's only got one left before she hands over to the new leader, but it might be a good idea to actually listen to the answers. I, I started out by saying, and I'll say it again, not for the benefit of Jackie Bailey, but for the benefit of, benefit of people watching, I, as First Minister of this country, take responsibility for the NHS. I will never shy away from that, and I will be judged, as will my government, on the progress we are making and will continue to make in the National Health Service. Let me just come back on a couple of the things Jackie Bailey mentioned. She talked about the fact that there are more staff vacancies in the health service. That is true, and that is a challenge we need to confront. But there are more staff vacancies because there are more staff working in the NHS, significantly increased numbers of people working across our National Health Service. She also mentioned the number of beds. There's actually been a small increase in the number of beds in the NHS over the past year. But can I point Jackie Bailey to the fact that I think, and she can correct me if I'm wrong in this, that bed numbers in the NHS, acute bed numbers, fell in each and every year of the last Labour administration. That was the reality. And in terms of the Glasgow Royal Infirmary, this is also where she may have benefited from actually uh, listening to what I said, I mentioned the GRI report in answer to her second question. That report is unacceptable and the Health Secretary has spoken already this morning to the Chair of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. But let me just put this into context. Since this government took office, rates of C. diff, I've already mentioned, have fallen by over 80% across Scotland. They've fallen by 84.7% in Glasgow. So yes, I will never shy away from addressing the problems that need to be confronted in our NHS, but I am also not going to stand by and allow Labour to trash the record yeah, of our yeah, NHS because absolutely. they don't deserve it. Yeah. Question two, Ruth Davidson. Thank you. To ask the First Minister when she'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. I will have the pleasure of meeting the Secretary of State this afternoon. Ruth Davidson. I wish you a good meeting. Um, yesterday, the Chancellor unveiled a tax cut for 98% of all home buyers. From midnight, people looking to get on in life will save thousands of pounds. But come April, when the Scottish Government takes over, that relief will go. Under this government's Swinney tax, we now know that if you want to move up the property ladder, it's going to cost thousands of pounds more. Order. It is a left-wing nationalist tax on aspiration. Now, the First Minister doubtless has some pre-prepared lines, rehashing Order. claims that the Chancellor has copied her plans and that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. But people aren't fooled when they're hit in their own pockets. This isn't a debating point. This is yet another ideological attack on the aspirations of Middle Scotland. If you want to buy, if you want to buy a three hundred thousand pound flat in Edinburgh or Aberdeen today, Order. that will cost you five thousand pounds. 
from April, that will rise to £7,300. So if she leaves those lines to one side for a moment, can the First Minister explain why she thinks that's fair? First Minister. Can I say firstly to, to Ruth Davidson, I, I, I love the Deputy First Minister dearly, but I've always thought he was an unlikely candidate for class warrior. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> we'll leave that to one side. Can I say, first of all, that I would actually congratulate the UK Government on emulating Mr Swinney's plans to get rid of an unfair system and replace it with a fairer system. As the Deputy First Minister said yesterday, imitation is indeed the sincerest form of flattery. Look, the Scottish rates that John Swinney has proposed reflect the nature of the Scottish housing market, as they should do. That is the whole point of devolving responsibility for the tax to the Scottish Government. Average house prices in Scotland are lower than they are across the rest of the UK, some £100,000 lower. So therefore, the higher tipping point, if we can call it that, in the UK system reflects higher house prices across the rest of the UK. But let me just inject a few facts uh, for Ruth Davidson to reflect on. Firstly, 80%, in fact, more than 80% of all transactions in Scotland every year will attract tax of either zero or less than the amount under the UK system announced yesterday. And there are 5,000 5,000 more transactions a year that will be completely exempt from tax under our system compared to the UK system announced yesterday. Now, why is that important? Because that helps to support more first-time buyers onto the property ladder. That's good for first-time buyers, but getting more first-time buyers into the property system is also good for people further up the ladder. So what we've proposed is a fair progressive system and one that is right for conditions in Scotland. I would have thought Ruth Davidson would have welcomed that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ruth Davidson. The First Minister wants to trade figures, then let's trade figures. 98% of people under the Chancellor's plans are better off this morning. And she's now going to claw those gains back off of thousands of Scots for no good reason. And I don't think the First Minister quite realises how isolated she is on this. E Even Order. Labour has backed the Chancellor's proposals. So in other words, the new First Minister has achieved the staggering feat in just a fortnight of becoming even more left-wing than Ed Miliband. So I can tell her today... Order! Right. Can we hear Ms Davidson? I don't know if that's a damning indictment on the First Minister or a damning indictment on Ed Miliband. Uh, I can tell her today that the Conservatives will be placing an amendment to the Scottish Budget to ensure that middle-income families who want to buy a home will pay less tax. We will campaign night and day for this amendment to be carried and we will look for support for this amendment from right across this chamber because we know that we have plenty of support from outside of it. So the new First Minister has a choice. She can either show some humility, accept that there is a need for a rethink here, or she can dig in her heels, drive her ideological agenda through and punish thousands of families. So which one is it? First Minister, firstly, can I say to uh, Ruth Davidson that even John Swinney is more left-wing than Ed Miliband, so that is not, <laughs> not much of a competition. Uh, I think you should maybe set the, the bar a little bit higher than that. Uh, Ruth Davidson wants to trade figures, so let's try and, uh, before, I, before I genuinely try and find some common ground with her, let's try and trade figures accurately. She said that uh, as a result of the UK government's proposals announced yesterday, 98% of people will be better off. Can I just point out to her, that's compared to the old UK government scheme, not compared to the new Scottish scheme yes. that we propose for introduction. Yes. Comparing the new UK government scheme to the Scottish scheme that will come in next April, as I said, 80% of transactions yep. will either pay the same or yep. less tax than under the new UK yep. system. So 80% of people either paying nothing at all or less than will be the situation under the new UK system. So that's the reality, and Ruth Davidson might want to grapple with that. But I, in the interest of the consensus, for which I am becoming so known, um, <laughs> let me say to her, if she wants to bring forward proposals, we are 
in the midst of a budget scrutiny process, if she wants to bring forward proposals that says the 20% at the very top of the housing market should pay less, then she's free to do so. And as we do with all proposals that come forward, we will consider them. But as she does so, let me tell her she should also bring forward her proposals for who should pay more yeah. or where the extra money yeah. should come from. Yeah. So if she does that, if she does that, she might want to persuade her UK government colleagues to actually settle the issue of the block grant adjustment as well, so that we can genuinely know the extent to which our proposals are, as they are intended to be, revenue neutral. So if she wants to answer all of those questions, not just the ones that it suits her to answer, I'll be happy to listen. Question three, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the Chancellor's autumn statement and its impact on the Scottish budget. First Minister. Well, we welcome the additional Barnet consequentials of around £200 million that result from yesterday's autumn statement. As John Swinney said yesterday, we have committed to providing all of the health consequentials of around £125 million to our National Health Service. And we'll make announcements on the remaining consequentials in due course. That said, Presiding Officer, it is important to point out that these consequentials make up just 8% of the £2.7 billion worth of real term cuts that have been made to the Scottish yeah. budget since 2010. So yes, the consequentials are welcome, but let's not pretend that they're anything more than a small fraction of the austerity cuts that Scotland has suffered. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the First Minister for her answer. This week's Economist points out that the UK's deficit as a percentage of national income is higher than France, Italy or even Greece. Well, the Office for Budget Responsibilities, Economic and Fiscal Outlook, published yesterday, warns that 60% of UK government cuts will come in the next parliament. Does the First Minister therefore agree that the biggest threat to Scotland's economy is continued austerity, which all Westminster parties are signed up to, and that next year's UK election presents an opportunity for the people of Scotland to make clear that there is an alternative? First Minister. Well, I think Kenny Gibson is absolutely uh, correct to point to the OBR's economic and fiscal outlook that was published yesterday, because it does show that over the next few years, spending on public services is, uh, and I quote, projected to fall from 21.2% to 12.6% of GDP, and from £5,650 to £3,880 per head. And that's a direct quote from page six. To put it another way, presiding officer, under the Tories, and indeed, under Labour because they've signed up to the Tories' austerity plan, spending on public services as a share of the economy is set to fall to levels not seen since the 1930s. That is the price of Westminster austerity. So, presenting officer, I think Kenny Gibson is right and I also believe we need a strong Scottish voice at Westminster, an SNP voice to protect Scotland from the 60% cuts that Westminster parties are still planning. Ian Gray. Thank you, thank you, presiding officer. Those OBR forecasts the first minister was quoting also saw oil and gas revenue forecast to 2019 cut by a further four and a half billion pounds. So, will the first minister agree with me that the Smith Commission was wise not to devolve volatile oil and gas taxes, and the Scottish people were wiser still to reject an independence prospectus? based on our predecessor's predictions of a second oil boom, now laid bare as fantasy. First Minister. No, I, I won't agree with that, because I think I will leave it to Labour to argue the absurd position that Scotland, alone in the world, is somehow uniquely incapable of managing our own vast natural resources. I'll leave that paucity of ambition to those on the Labour benches. We all know that... Uh, Oil prices right now are the feature of temporary factors in supply and demand in the world. In fact, I simply point to OPEC, uh, World Oil Outlook, published just a few weeks ago, assuming at a nominal price of $110 per barrel for the rest of the decade. The key lesson we should all take from the mismanagement of our oil resources over decades now yeah. is that we should, as you know, I astonished to hear the Chancellor yesterday talk about a sovereign wealth fund for shale gas in the north of England when we've had the failure of Labour yeah. and Tory governments to set up an oil fund in Scotland like other countries have done. That's the lesson we should learn and we should resolve not to repeat that mistake in future. Gavin Brown. Thank you. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of yesterday's announcement of an increased retail discount to £1,500 for shops, cafes and restaurants with a rateable value of under £50,000. What is her response to that specific announcement? First well, Minister. as uh, Gavin Brown will be aware, we've got the most competitive business tax environment in the entire uh, UK and the uh, Finance Secretary will make uh, announcements around the remainder of the consequentials in due course, but we'll continue to take the right decisions for businesses across Scotland. The decisions we have been taking have been given our businesses, particularly our small businesses, including uh, many retail or pub premises, the most competitive environment in these islands, and that's what we'll continue to strive to do. Question four, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to tackle in-work poverty? First Minister. Well, the Government is taking steps now to tackle in-work poverty and help individuals realise their full potential. We recognise the importance of appropriate, flexible and sustainable employment, as well as appropriate levels of pay as a means to tackle poverty. And we have been strong and consistent in our efforts to stimulate growth and jobs within the context of economic recovery. Uh, we're also uh, determined to progress payment of the living wage. We're already paying that to everybody who works for the government or for our national health service. And while we cannot mandate it in law, each and every relevant government contract that is let from now on <coughs> will have payment of the living wage as a central priority. Claire Adams. Thank the First Minister for her answer. I'm sure she would want to join me in congratulating the Scottish Parliament in becoming a living wage employer. Yeah. But does she also share my disappointment and that of many organisations and academics across Scotland at the lack of welfare opportunities being offered by the Smith Commission proposals and agree that it looks like a missed opportunity for Scotland to be able to tackle in-work poverty effectively? First Minister. Um, well, can I, if I may, Presiding Officer, uh, join with Claire Adamson in congratulating you and the Parliament on becoming a living wage employer. I think that is fantastic. <laughs> Is, is absolutely right and it, it stands to reason does it not that in any area of policy the more powers we have in this parliament uh, the more able we are going to be to live up to the expectations of those we serve so we will do everything we can within the powers we have and using any new powers we get to lift people out of poverty but I believe that power over the minimum wage power over the personal allowance of income tax, power over the entirety of our welfare system. If this parliament was equipped in that way, we could do so, so much more. And that's why I'll continue to have the highest ambitions for this parliament and for this country. Question five, Neil Findlay. To first, ask the First Minister what response the Scottish Government has received to its representations to the UK Government regarding the implications of the Transatlantic Trade and Investment uh, Partnership for health services in Scotland. First Minister. Uh, well, the Scottish Government has, as Neil Finlay uh, refers to, made several representations to the UK Government and to the European Commission on this matter and made very clear, in particular, our concerns about the NHS and public services. And although both the UK Government and the European Commission have told us that the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership doesn't pose any threat to the NHS, I think it's fair to say that both the Scottish Government and the public need to see the final legal text of any agreement before we can be fully assured that the NHS and our other public services will be unaffected, as we certainly want to make sure is the case. Neil Findlay. Yeah, I welcome the fact that the Government has joined Scottish Labour MSPs and, and MPs, community groups, individuals and trade unions by writing to David Cameron demanding he uses his position to prevent the NHS being exposed to market competition via TTIP. Will the First Minister join me in urging the Tories and Liberal Democrats in this chamber to acquire a backbone and do the same, and so that we can speak with one voice to protect the National Health Service and other essential services from privatisation? First Minister. Well, I think Labour are closer to the Tories these days than I am, so he's probably better advised just to have that conversation directly. I'm sure the, the mechanisms of the Better Together campaign are still in operation in some form. But in all seriousness, Neil Finlay, Neil Finlay raises, I think, an important, an important point. Uh, I do believe that the concerns about the NHS and the inclusion of the NHS or public services in TTIP are uh, 
whether they're well founded remains to be seen, but I understand why people are raising those concerns. So we will continue to call for the exclusion of our NHS and to ensure that any agreement that is concluded does not put our public services under any threat. I disagree uh, very, very strongly with the privatisation of the health service in England, but that is not a matter for me. Uh, but I will fight tooth and nail over, uh, against any moves to privatise the NHS in Scotland uh, by the back door. Uh, and this agreement, if it ever put that threat there, would be opposed strongly by this government. Question six, Margaret Mitchell. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the accuracy of the reporting of crime statistics. First Minister. Well, I agree with uh, Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland, Derek Penman, who recently uh, was quoted as saying, Police Scotland's own auditing of crime recording is good. Margaret Mitchell. Thank the First Minister for that response on recording. Last week, however, the Scottish Government announced that recorded crime is at a 40-year low, but at present, these figures don't take into account assault, stalking, online or by any other means, abusive behaviour and drink driving, all of which are classed as offences rather than crimes. Will the First Minister acknowledge that the government's failure to include over half a million offences like these does a huge disservice to victims and undermines public confidence in the criminal justice system? And will she now carry out a review to ensure that the government includes these offences when reporting on crime statistics? First Minister. Well, I mean, this is a, a serious question. The public uh, deserve to know that the statistics that are published can be relied on, and I think that applies across every aspect of government policy. Uh, recorded crime is at a 40-year low, and I think we should all welcome that. But Margaret Mitchell draws attention to a distinction in the statistics between crimes and offences. And she used a phrase in her question to me that said, at present, that distinction is being made. I think Margaret Mitchell should maybe have done some historical research before asking me her question today, because the separation of crime and offences statistics has been in place since the 1920s. We report on recorded crime in exactly the same way as previous administrations, uh, with the bulletin that's published in the same format that it's been in since 1983. There has been no change to the approach that we are taking. Now, at times, New legislation can enhance the definition of a particular crime or offence. So, for example, prior to the introduction of the offences of threatening or abusive behaviour and stalking, these incidents would have been classified as breach of the peace. Breach of the peace has consistently been classed as an offence. And therefore, to ensure consistency of reporting of breach of the peace type offences over time, these offences are also being classified as offences. It's all about making sure that the consistency in the figures is there. So I'll always look at these things to see if, and national statistics are obviously prepared independently of government to see if we can improve them. But don't come to this chamber and suggest there's been some change to a system that's been in place since the 1920s. <laughs> Thank you. That ends First Minister's questions. We move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.